welcome to BreezeLine, where you'll say, ta-ta, T-Mobile, our home internet is just plain better, more reliable and faster because we put internet first. If there's network congestion, we won't slow your internet down like T-Mobile does to help their cell customers. And right now, you can try out a true internet experience with BreezeLine's reliable and fast fiber-powered home internet. Find your perfect speed with prices starting at $19.99 a month for 24 months. Terms and conditions apply. Go to BreezeLine.com to learn more. If you're a content creator, you know the struggle of picking between quality and quantity to grow your channel, especially if you're on a tight budget. But why not choose both? With Storyblocks, you get everything you need to create amazing videos fast. Instead of expensive pay-per-clip pricing, you get unlimited downloads from a library with millions of stock assets for one set price. Plans start at $15 a month. Go to storyblocks.com slash red circle to learn more. Welcome to the Behind the Bits podcast. Your host, Scott Curtis, wants to learn everything he can about stand-up comedy and take you along for the ride. Scott and his guests talk serious about comedy in every episode. Behind the Bits will uncover knowledge from different perspectives on subjects such as writing and performing stand-up comedy, as well as booking shows and the comedy life. If you're thinking about becoming a stand-up comic, already in the comic game, or a comedy nerd, Behind the Bits is the show for you. Now, let's get Behind the Bits. All right, Behind the Bits buddies, I'm still Scott Curtis, and I'm here with Michael Palisak today. How you doing? Good, how are you? Great. So Michael is an Indiana native that, uh, that uh, are, are you a Ball State grad? No, or, a lot of my high school went to Ball State, but I I went to Xavier in Cincinnati. Okay, okay. Um, mm-hmm. And um, we do have a connection. Uh, I think you used to date m- my wife's best friend's niece. Uh, oh, yeah? She was from Wabash. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, I, we, I, uh, Lisa and I came to see you at the drop um, when you did it the last time. That Was that last year or the year before? Um, the drop was a little while ago, so it must have been the year before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, uh, I've always been a fan and, uh, been, been watching you as you are on all the shows like Colbert and doing the comedy central and stuff like that. Yeah. Always been a fan of your style and, uh, it's really great to have you on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah. No, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. For sure. So at this point, how long have you been doing stand up? The first time I went on stage was, uh, July in 2002. Okay. Um, so, but I was in college, so I wasn't like doing it all the time. Mm-hmm. So I finished school in 2004 and that's when it was like more of a full-time thing. So it was like in May, it'll be 16 years. Wow. Full-time. Yeah. You're such a young, young looking guy. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about, um, I, I don't think stand-up comedy is ever anyone's uh, first choice for a profession when they're a kid, but obviously you were exposed to it. Uh, who who were some of the first uh, comics that, that you saw that you thought, hey, this is kind of neat, I might want to do it? When I was a little kid, um, uh, I remember watching on TV a, uh, a guy, I forget, what they're called a uh, ventriloquist. Oh, okay. And, uh, I was probably like six or seven and we were all laughing as a family. Like I have two brothers and I think that's the first time I was ever like, Oh, this is like a really cool job. And I didn't think I, I mean, I, I think to me that was a comedian the same as a person talking. Like I didn't. Mm. And, and so I think that always stuck with me how much fun that was um, as a, to watch. And then my parents had like Cosby records and uh, I heard Seinfeld. And then when I started, Mitch Hedberg was really big. Mm-hmm. So those were like the comedian people that were there. But I remember that moment when I was in like, you know, first grade the most is like realizing what that is. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So when you went to college, what, what did you study when you went to school? I was an English major and yeah. I did like a theater minor. Didn't you, you, yeah. you do a great bit about that. So the, oh, the, the, the whole English major thing, that was great. 
Um, I think your best line, my favorite line of that is, um, the only thing I know about capitalism is you need a bigger letter after the period. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that yeah. was great. But yeah. yeah, I, uh, I, like I said, I've, I've been a fan for a long time. So going from seeing these comics that you thought were pretty cool and then yeah. being in college, uh, what was your first, uh, uh, exposure, like an open mic or, or what did you do? So when I was a freshman in college, my parents, my dad started working in Joliet. So everyone sort of moved up okay. to the suburbs of Chicago and I didn't, uh, I was home for the summer, didn't know anybody. So, um, the first summer I didn't, really do much like that type of stuff. But the second summer uh, we weren't really moving. So I had time and I went to a bookstore and I just found a book on stand up. And in the back of the book, it listed a bunch of like new talent, open mic things. Uh-huh. And one of them was like 15 minutes to where my parents had just moved. So I like called them. I think I went online too, but I called them and asked to go up and uh, uh-huh. they signed, signed me up for the next week or, or a month away or whatever. And then I did it. That's cool. So were, were you one of them that brought all your friends or did you just go alone? Oh, no. I, I think one of the reasons that I liked it, that I felt comfortable doing was that no one saw me for years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think my aunt and her friend came early on and some of my cousins came early on, but it wasn't a good experience. <laughs> like, it was yeah. like, they're laughing because they know I'm there and they know they like me or whatever, but. I always felt like it was better when you're a lot better for people to come. Right. And I think there's a correlation because it seems like most of them that I see that uh, come in and they've got like a whole table of family and friends, Mm -hmm. uh, you see them once or twice maybe. And then, then they, then they tend to go away. They've done their bucket list thing and now they're done. Uh, but yeah, I remember talking to a friend of mine and she said that, if she had done really well, if she hadn't done really well the first time she went up, she might not have kept doing it. And I, I've always been judgmental of that yeah. attitude to people because I feel like stand up is so much about the grind, the failure. It's fun, but you're not always going to do well. And yeah. Even when you do well, the people might not be laughing because they're eating or talk, whatever. So yeah. it's like, I've always tried to embrace it or find that philosophy of like, this is good because it's good, not because it's a, it's a positive, right. successful show. <laughs> Yeah, and I I think that the the shitty set, sets are almost as important as the good sets because they're yeah. a learning experience. Oh yeah, I know. Whenever I'm running a set for something important, and it's like I'll go to the shows, and I've heard of other comedians doing that too, where it's like I go to the shows not on purpose, but sometimes I'll do poorly, just in the sense of like if you're watching, you'd be like, oh, he's not going to want laughs, and I always feel much better about that than if I'm killing before I go do a really good set, just because I feel like when you're doing poorly, you really have to do better. You have to like communicate your jokes in a way. Whereas like if you're killing and the crowd is hot, you might not be communicating them as strongly. They just might be really into you and you don't, you don't really know. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, I think that they both serve a purpose as far. So you do that open mic. uh, How how many of those did you do before you said, Hey, this is something I want to do with my life. Well, I'm really grateful. My parents have always been very practical and somewhat conservative, but my dad and mom have always been like encouraging of doing what you love in some sort of sense, whether it was in high school or college or after. And so I remember I was working at a company my dad worked at in a warehouse and uh, I told him right after I did it. And he was like, he made almost like a, he made it seem like it was such a big step. I think that's the word he said. And, his, and like, he took it pretty seriously. And I think I had going into it, but it made me realize that just doing it was a big deal mm-hmm. um, at the time. And so then I did it again. And then the next summer I did it uh, every week, like every week I did it. And I think the next summer I was 21. So I could go to the other club in the areas that I had 21 and over. Uh-huh. And, then, and then I think when I was a senior in college, I was driving back and I listened to an interview that Seinfeld did on laugh.com. And when I listened to that and he sort of described the process, I think that's when I was like, oh, this is something um, that I could do. Right. And yeah. from that time to the time that uh, you started uh, actually making a decent living from it, how many years was that? So that was probably like 2003, 2004. And then in 2000, 
it seemed like so much longer at the time, but really not that bad looking at it now. I think 2000, uh, I bought my car in the spring of 2009. And that was after like a year mm. of being, like pretty much being on my, like I always, I lived with my parents for a while. Um, so 2008 was probably like when I first started to make, like I did a bunch of colleges and could make enough money. To, like, uh, right. Yeah. So uh, one of the reasons I like you, obviously, is because, uh, first of all, you talk about real stuff. But uh, next, I, I like the the clean aspect, the, the yeah. fact that you, you, you keep it pretty darn clean. And uh, there seems to be a resurgence of that. And, you know, we, we always had Gaffigan, but uh, we've yeah. got like, um, uh, I, I watched... Uh, uh, Nate, uh, Bargetsy at uh, a couple sold out shows and, you know, and it was funny. I I saw the same act twice, but it (laughs) it was, it was still worth it. Um, but there, you know, there, there was a really, I mean, just a few years ago, the alt comics and, and the ones that were, you know, super in your face or, um, just, uh, uh, I guess, uh, super eccentric or whatever were the big thing it seems like the the clean comedies coming back around and i i i i I respect folks that can do that because that's really cool thanks yeah when i when i started i think on that interview that seinfeld said he talked about how he didn't always not swear it was just one time he took a swear word out of a joke and the joke stopped working and he was like oh that means my writing isn't very good because Uh if i can remove this one word that doesn't matter so I think I took that to heart. And also when I started, um, I really wanted to do TV. And at the time, you really couldn't swear on TV. Like, and that changed, I think, in the mid to late 2000s where they just didn't care. And you could do cable. And like that, as like Netflix and stuff got bigger, it didn't matter. So I think like there was, a, uh, there was that, that a push towards or it didn't really matter anymore. But now I think at a beginner level or any level, unless you're famous, you can make more money through serious radio if you're clean. And like, mm-hmm. it seems like dry bar specials are making a lot of money. And like yeah. uh, Jim Gaffigan can do like huge arenas and like in our So I, I think, uh, I think there is a financial aspect of it. I like it that everybody can come and laugh. Like I always felt growing up that I wanted to watch stuff with my family because mm-hmm. I was a middle child and I enjoyed when everyone was around. And I didn't like it when like we couldn't watch something because it wasn't appropriate or yeah. Or, and my parents were kind of conservative like that, so it wouldn't be appropriate. And so I like it that everyone can come come together and enjoy it. Yeah, that's yeah. It's it. It's harder to do. Um, it, it's it's uh, like Se- Seinfeld said. You know, he he removed one word, and then all of a sudden it wasn't funny. And yeah, <laughs> uh, it also. Um, uh, dropping, uh, four letter words and lots of sexual in- innuendos, uh, tends to fill up a lot of time too. So you're, yeah. you're actually writing more to, to get a clean set than you are to do a dirty set. I think I watched, uh, I don't know if this is relatable. Did you ever see the movie, the prestige? Yeah. Yeah. So I love that movie. And, uh, there's that magician that like lays an egg on stage or whatever, uh, and they can yeah. figure out how he did it. Yeah. And then eventually they figure out he just walks around with an egg in him all, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like with stand up, I sort of try it. Not like I'm not like necessarily like I, I swear to myself and all, but I felt like from the beginning I wanted to do a specific thing. And I think that helped me. It'd be hard if you were dirty for 10 years then to be like, oh, I'm going to be clean now. Yeah. Yeah. Most, yeah. most definitely. It's, it's a yeah. lot harder to go back than it is to just start yeah. that way. Like when people say it's hard, I'm just like, well, I have. Uh, that's just what I do, but I think it would be. Yeah. 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 Now you've got a, I, I guess I would call it a particular cadence and a particular way of, of, um, doing your act and speaking. And, uh, I really respect the fact that you have enough confidence that you don't mind, uh, taking a pause of, of a rather long pause. And it's, it's kind of like, I uh, I already me- mentioned Bargetsy. It's it's kind of in that vein. Um, how long did it take you to find out how to get that cadence? And you know, as I watch your stuff, it's almost um, 
I, I almost think of it as like uh, musical. So it's, oh. you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, you got sustains and you got the chorus and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. how, how, how did you develop that cadence? Was it always there or did you, did you have to work on that? I think it's something that's still in progress. Like I feel like uh, the, how I talk on stage is constantly evolving to a point where I'm trying to be more and more and more and enjoy the laughs more. And also I feel like it's more surprising to me and the jokes are funnier if I'm not just like, this is how the joke is every time. Mm -hmm. So I think from that standpoint, I, I just recorded a new album and I think that one sounds, I think they've all sounded a little different. And I think that's good because I think you should, you, we change as people, so it should change as a little bit. Mm -hmm. For the pauses, I remember I read a book where I interviewed with different comedians and I think Louis Anderson said that when he was on stage, he tried to wait as long as he could before he moved on and obviously it's very short in real right. life it's a couple seconds but it, it does make you sort of listen to the audience and hear where they're laughing and then then go on your next thing rather than just like and there's definitely a place for like pushing through and building a laugh but i think i think that uh that that always rang true and then when i started doing longer sets like headlining in a club and doing 45 minutes um the the crowd is more on your side and like you can get laughs out of different things. And I think that's where that sort of came around. Like you don't yeah. have to like do the joke right away. You can respond to what you just said, either emotionally or with a pause or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think also like I did uh, some improv classes in Chicago when I started. And one of my teachers was uh, Michael Patrick O'Brien. I remember one time in class, he said that uh, you don't always, if you're not getting a laugh, it doesn't mean that you're not funny. You could just be building the tension to that point where you get a bigger laugh. And I, I always right. thought that was important. Yeah. I always thought that was important. Yeah. Yeah. There, I, I talked to uh, quite a few old school comics and it's all yeah. the laughs per minute thing. And, yeah. and, and, and that's, I, I mean, that's totally a great way to mm -hmm. grade yourself or, or yeah. find out how well you're doing, but also the quality of the laugh really makes yeah. a lot of sense too. I mean, it's those, those are the ones that the people remember when they, when they leave is the ones that they really <laughs> laughed hard at. Yeah, for sure. I, I worked with a guy recently in Washington or Portland, maybe it was Oregon. That's where I was. And he was one of those guys that was like, he went up and it was just like, he just like killed, 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 killed. And um, I think it was good to see. It's always good. I think as a community to see people who sort of deliver differently than you, because it's always, I think it's a trap to get stuck in the rut of like, this is how I talk. Yeah. Uh, because when you're on stage, that's not how people, people like when I'm talking to you, I'm not thinking this is how I talk to Scott right now. Like, mm -hmm. so I think hearing him was really good. Um, and I think like, I, I have certain like, um, not ground rules, but like, Oh, I want to talk about things that are real to me. And uh, so I'm not going to like lie about something just to get an extra laugh per minute or whatever. Right. I think, that makes the overall experience better for the audience, but other people might disagree with that. And mm -hmm. they're like, oh, yeah. And I that's, think all fine. that's another thing I really like about your humor is it looks like everything you do is rooted in truth. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's your life. Yeah. All the details, everything. I think um, when I started out, one of my friends was uh, Tommy Jonigan and he was very funny and, he never said it was wrong to like, and I think people have different theories on like whether you lie on stage or whether you tell the truth, but I always felt like there was a value to that. When, when I was an English major in college, there was, I think it was, uh, I forget his name now, some writer that was like the more specific you can be with the parameters of what you're writing on, the more creative you're going to be. So mm. if I like say, I'm only going to talk about things that actually happened to me and use details that are real um then that's going to make me talk about things in a more creative funny way right yeah. i i and i'm not i i'm not by any means uh the same level of comic as you because i i started when i was 50 so and i'm 55 now and yeah. so obviously but my stuff all comes from you know my mm -hmm. real life and stuff like that it seems to me that 
you remember your act better when it's personal. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. It's like, yeah. it's like when you go on to the next bit, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, that's, you know, I'm talking about my kids now. So, you know, yeah. it, it, it seems to, um, for me, I don't need my notes as much because, because it's just part of my life. And I, I just wrote a bit or a joke about it. So it makes it easier. Yeah. And I think there's definitely like, a difference and this is some something i've heard other people say too where it's like kevin nealon is very much or zach galifianakis is very much like oh they're making stuff up that's up but it's like everybody knows that and so they're being true to them being as right. a comedian the right. difference between that and being like oh my car blew up this week and then it's like well uh okay or whatever it is yeah that you, yeah yeah, and i there's a place for both but i yeah. just uh i i mean the the stuff that that comes from real life, I it, it's just the stuff that I gravitate towards, and it it really um it really hits home, and I tend to remember those sets better. But uh, yeah. you know, that's that everybody's got a different different uh, flavor that they like. For sure. Uh, thinking about your your writing process and how it's uh, evolved, so you know, as, as you were starting to um, headline, do you have like a certain writing schedule that you do or do you just write stuff down as it comes how does it work for you i i've always tried to do all different types i remember i've heard like both styles like always write the same time every day in the same place and whatever mm -hmm. and then i heard another just i don't know if he was even a comedian but he just said uh if you write in different places at different times and different it's gonna open up different ways of thinking that you might not have had so I'm not too strict on like, I have to be sitting also as a comedian you're traveling around. So you don't have like the, the, uh, whatever of like Stephen King or someone just going to the same place every day for yeah whatever. So basically I like, if I think of something, I definitely write it down. And then if I'm then a, whatever, uh, like now with things and like my life, I don't have as much time to write because of, we have a baby and I'm home and I'm a dad. So I like, mm -hmm. there's different ways I do it. So before I would just like free write or like have a joke and free write around an idea and mm -hmm. then go back and read it. But, uh, and I still do that, but I do that like maybe like once or three times a week. And then the other times I'm just sort of like talking out loud to my son and then trying to remember stuff. Or if I'm driving, I'll like say it out loud and then just try to remember the things I think are funny. Uh -huh. and, uh, so I just constantly, rather than being like, this is how I write and checking it off the list. I'm, I think the goal is to constantly be like working on it, working on it, working on it, working on it. Right. Do yeah. you feel like uh, the, uh, you know, obviously we're recording this during quarantine time. Do you feel like it's harder to write now? Um, I think it's harder for me because I have a family and it's like, they're all here. Yeah. If I was by myself, it might be easier, you know, but it is easier too, because I'm immersed in this like, uh, experience that a lot of other people are immersed in, like are living right now. Uh -huh. And I think as a comedian, the easier, the more you're connected with people that are watching, the easier it is. So even though as a dad, like you lose time of writing, I feel like my jokes come quicker because I'm living this experience that right. is very rare, relatable in some ways, horrible in some ways. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's I, I, I I'm jealous that, that you got your uh, kid there because I've got a grandson out in the D.C. area and, oh, and yeah. all we can do is FaceTime and we got one of those yeah. Alexas, uh, the echoes that we can uh, uh, do video chat, which we were doing yeah. all the way up until the time I sat down to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> but we yeah. uh, we've actually got tickets to go see him at the end of this month, which I don't think is going to happen. So, yeah, yeah so is that's that's the rough part of it because he's growing and he's yeah. uh, he's gonna be two in july i think oh wow yeah. yeah my son will be he's 16 months right now yeah yeah good age yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> i was i still worked when he, like when he was born i would do the comedian thing of like leaving thursday through saturday or whatever whatever day because because we had to work yeah and so i still got to be home a couple days a week and see him but it's really fun seeing him every day and like you said, they grow and change so much. Oh yeah, I mean, just day, day to day, it's uh, they they grow a little bit, so it's it's neat to be able to be there. And yeah. that that kind of goes into my next question: your your schedule. So when you're when you're starting to do this full time, yeah. it's obviously a grind. Did you have a relationship going at that time um, when when you started doing that? 
Yeah, I was in college uh, or just finished college and I had a girlfriend that was still in college. So we were like, was uh, I was spending a lot of time with that person thing versus like, this is just kind of hard thing mm-hmm. for like a year or two. And then that ended um, when she graduated college. So we, it was probably like a year and a half like that. And, uh, and then I didn't really have like a serious relationship for a while. Um, and I think it wasn't one of those things where I was like, I'm a comedian. I'm not going to find, I'm not going to, I'm going to focus on that. It was just like, I think it's hard to be in that game when you're leaving town. Like mm-hmm. you can meet people and hang out with them, but, uh, you don't have a lot on other, like if someone's meeting somebody and they're hanging and they're there and they live there, that's, that's hard to compete with. Yeah. <laughs> you're traveling yeah. around, uh, because people want to hang out with you all like every weekend or whatever. Yeah. So I think that was, it. I think like looking back, it's, it's a challenge to do that. And, and there's benefits in the sense that if you were with someone long distance or, or you uh, wanted to meet different people in different states, you can. But mm-hmm. I think like, if I lived in Chicago and had a normal job, it would have been a much different experience than like traveling around all the time. Mm. What's it like now that you're in a relationship? If you were if you were touring now, um, how does your uh, significant other feel about you know the fact that you're a comic? Yeah, well, I think one of the reasons it worked out with her versus all the other ones that didn't work out was because. Uh, she was very supportive and like, she's really funny. She doesn't necessarily do stand up. She's done it, but, and, and so I think she likes being a part of that. Like she's been always been cool with me making jokes about her mm. and, and just the lifestyle. I think, I think in the beginning it worked because uh, we were able to hang out when I was in town. And then when I left, she understood. And now uh, it was harder because we have a baby and like, I would leave, but um I just think, uh, I think we just have to see how that's going to be with a child. Like, I think for the first couple of years, it'll be okay. Cause we can sort of travel together and stuff. But right. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. It, it's, it's good. It's good to have the support. And yeah. it, I know relationships are tough in the, in the comedy world sometimes. And well, I know. I mean, every story I hear, like I finally got an agent, uh, this summer and he was, almost bragging about how he booked so many colleges for a comedian that his wife left him. I'm like, well, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, like I love the work and I love, it feels good. And it's a way to support ourselves. Um, but I think, uh, I think there's gotta be a, some sort of compromise of like, you can have this life that you want, but also you can go to, go to work. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I think it's probably changed a little bit for you from, uh, doing the one nighters and, uh, going a couple hundred miles between the one nighters to at least you can do a weekend, you know, (laughs) in the sense that when I try to get in with like the Yoders and the people that book all those one nighters, Mm -hmm. that's when I just did like a NACA and started doing a ton of colleges. So I never really had that live that life of like doing a show for not a lot of money than driving a ton of like where you're almost losing money. Mm. Uh, I do travel like being in LA, it is more of a challenge because it's such a far flight for everything. Yeah. Like you lose at least half a day either way or a quarter of a day. Mm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, usually when I leave, it's, it makes a difference financially, which is nice to be right. able to. You mentioned uh, Tommy Jonigan. Did anybody else uh, uh, come out as being uh, either supportive or a good mentor for you as you were coming out? Yeah, I don't know if you know. Have you heard of Brian Hicks? He's a yeah. Chicago guy. Yeah. Yeah. So when I started, uh, the, it was the Barrel Laughs, which isn't there anymore. Um, he was there, and a couple other comedians, Denise Ramsden and Ken Schultz and Fitz mm. and Todd Glover, and they were all and Brian Aldridge too. I would say. Brian Hicks and Brian Aldridge were the most supportive in the sense that like they would actually like, they all talk to me in life and about life. But like I would ask Brian questions and he would be very good at answering them about mm-hmm. hosting and stuff like that. And then Aldridge was very good at like, just being like, don't do be more yourself. And like, just really good advice that I think sped me along quicker. Whereas if I had just gone into the city and done open mics and like been around people that weren't necessarily working as comedians in clubs, but just were sort of like doing it, to get to that point or as an expression, it might've taken me longer. I might've figured out different things quicker, but I think that sort of working in clubs and sort of being a comedian would have came slower. So I'm mm. really grateful. Yeah. 
when yeah. you were uh, obviously you had to spend uh, some years as an opening act. Who yeah. who did you uh, work with as an opening act that you you just really loved and and you thought they were just the best? Yeah, that's a good question. I I think like the people at the beginning were always like you. I felt like I learned so much just because like you get to see someone do 45 minutes yeah. and uh and i'm trying to think of like don reese was one of the first headliners i worked with mm. um sonia white would take me out sometimes um mike toomey was always very funny kevin bozeman was funny mm. um I, I, unfortunately i mean they're they were all great but I, I didn't ever get to work with someone where i was like this is the person that personality wise and like how we work really matched up in the sense of like, I could see this, them living the career that I sort of would have. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like Dan Cummins was one of those guys, but I never got to work with him. Like, I feel like he was very much like a, I love that guy. Writer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, Jake Johansson was really funny, but he, we didn't really like get to hang out a ton. Of and like, I got to work mm -hmm. with Bill Burr one time and that was great. And, and uh jimmy fallon and some of those bigger guys but that was just sort of like one weekend michael mcdonald was very nice uh -huh. um yeah 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 uh so you're still doing colleges i i think that speaks to the type of act that you have because there's a lot of comics that just won't do colleges anymore uh <laughs> yeah, i think I, I, I think bill burr is one of them um the <laughs> you know he, you know he's a little edgy you know he does yeah. he he, he speaks his mind and stuff like that i guess that goes back to the type of comedy that you do you can pretty much do anywhere and uh well, that's great it's funny you say that because bill burr like he was with my agent for years. Like they, uh -huh. they represented Bill Burr forever. I do think though, there was that thing that came out a few years ago where like Seinfeld would, didn't want to do colleges because they were so politically correct. And then I think Mulaney came out and said, is like, I think, I think they're just not paying him enough. Like I think that's why I don't do colleges. They don't, they don't have money. <laughs> I'm just like, that's so funny because I think that is the thing. Like when I do a college, obviously I would love to make more, but it is, it does make a difference to do one show that pays so much better than like, yeah. Uh, either matches up to a week of shows at a club or whatever. Right. Uh, but yeah. Have you ever done <laughs> corporate gigs? Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I, I, they're, they've been great. And those, those line up really well. I feel like in my career, if there's one thing, which I don't know if I've had extra time to do it, but you make time for it. If I could have marketed myself, more towards that too like some guys you go to their websites and they have like quotes from people that have, they've done shows with and it really looks like they'd be a good corporate fit whereas like i got a lot because they did last comic standing and that was great mm -hmm. and now that, that that hasn't happened it sort of slowed down i did do a corporate a few years ago i think it's two years ago where it was in for petting house in illinois and they're very nice it was like for their factory workers it was like during the day thing the owner was so cool he wanted me to take shots with them before the show mm. and for the afternoon experience is like noon or one o'clock and they were they were really nice but um that year um laney was supposed to do their like national show or, uh -huh. or whatever and uh and we were talking about that and, and he canceled because he got to host that starting live that weekend <laughs> and i was like oh wow yeah that's crazy that that interacted and that he canceled and then the owner's wife was like yeah well, i guess i guess uh you can uh, when you can afford to not make the 300 then you can do that <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> he turned out three hundred thousand dollars wow <laughs> <laughs> so well that's why you're not doing colleges if you're making that much money yeah and i don't get all corporates are that much at all but i i think i heard a story about one comedian who wasn't super famous at the time like he was kind of famous mm -hmm. and at college asked his agent how much his price was and they said it was a hundred thousand dollars which is what like leno would get at the time it was like 10 years ago mm -hmm. and uh and they're like oh we don't have that at all and they're like oh well we, we can route him around you he'll do it for 10 and it's like yeah of course he'll do it for 10 uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well that that's another thing that uh comics have a problem with is knowing what their worth is uh yes. and and i i i know a guy that's coming up and you know he's had people approach him and and the shows the shows aren't paying in the thousands but they're paying in in the high hundreds and yeah. and they're um they're saying you know what do you want and 
and he'll you know he'll say five six hundred or something like that and and then he'll shoot me a message and they said oh that's a lot cheaper than we thought we were going to get you for so yeah. it, it's 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 hard to determine your worth and yet when you look back at it there's so much work behind what you do that that, that it is worth that oh yeah like it's not an hourly wait rate of like, oh, you're making two thousand dollars for this show or whatever, or yeah. five thousand dollars. It's like no, no, this is like basically I wrote a novel over ten years of my life. Yeah. And I'm gonna go deliver that in person to you. Mm. So that that's what you're paying for. And I think I think like like I think agents do it better if you can have somebody, if you are a comedian, if you can have somebody like just say they like this is my friend. Say you have a friend that like, hey, can you just ask him? Just ha- do it through somebody else, so that way it's not like you being like, I need more money. Because I think like I, I but there's really not much of a science to. It. I feel like when you're bigger, it's easier to ask for more money. Like I'm sure if someone really wants you, you can ask. Like there's stories of like Tim Allen turning down a New Year's gig for like a million dollars or something like that, uh-huh. or like Seinfeld performing for the Orlando Magic on an island. Like there's there's money that's crazy, but I think. Uh, my agents, it sounds like they just sort of ask what the other, what their budget is. And then they ask for like either that or a little more. And usually you can tell that a customer is just being honest and they're not trying to rip you off. Clubs right. and like bars and stuff are more difficult to deal with, I think. But I think when it comes to corporates and stuff like that, maybe it's a little easier. Yeah. Did you ever run into Greg Schwen? Update your home and get 11% off all countertop at Menards. Menards countertops are durable, dependable, affordable, and easy to install. Transform everyday spaces into gathering places with Menards' great selection of quartz and laminate countertop. Visit our kitchen showrooms in-store or go to Menards.com to get started on your update today and save 11% on all countertop at Menards. Good through March 26th. Savings are mail-in rebate. Some exclusions apply. See store for details. Save big money at Menards. Welcome to BreezeLine, where you'll say, ta-ta, T-Mobile, because we've got more reliable home internet that's a whole lot faster. In fact, 10 times faster. No, seriously, because we have real internet backed by our fiber-powered network. And T-Mobile, well, they just have a 5G cellular network. So act now to get superior home internet. Find your perfect speed with prices starting at just $19.99 a month for 24 months. Terms and conditions apply. Go to BreezeLine.com to learn more. Um, when you were in Chicago, I I've seen his like picture and like my dad has his book and like I've seen his stuff line, but I don't yeah. know if you've ever met. He, 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 he was one of my guests, and he's like he's like the pro at corporate, and yeah. uh, and uh, he's made a real real good niche for himself there. The yeah. the sad part is we were working on doing a show together in uh, Michigan right before the quarantine hit, so oh, ho- hopefully we can still make that happen after we can get out. <laughs> yeah. I just had a June date canceled. I was just like, oh, this wow. Is crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, so how do you feel like this is going to come out for comics uh, at the, at the end of this? Because, yeah. you know, you guys are, you guys are just missing out on all your dates. You're, yeah. you're, you're hemorrhaging money and, and, <laughs> and all that. How, how do you feel that's going to come out? That's, I'm glad. Cause like I've seen on Facebook recently, maybe it's just, I don't know why it's coming to my feed, but a couple different comedians have said who like have had success in comedy. They're not like people that have just been not doing a well. They've been people that either have had half hours or like have writing jobs. Now one of them said that stand-up comedy is an art form that's been dying for a long time and they don't know if it's going to make it out. And the other one was like, uh, we just need to accept that this is over now. And, mm. and I think, I think they're completely wrong. I think like if you look at all live stuff or even like Disneyland, like it's all dead now. Like, yeah. like and uh, it's all been great and full, full in the past. And I think with comedy, you can say like, Oh, I went to a club on a Wednesday and it wasn't that full, but I feel like that's being like, Oh, I went to an NBA G league game. So it wasn't really good. So the NBA might not be around anymore. It's like, yeah. no, like <laughs> still selling out arenas or whatever or football state like so i don't think dave Chappelle's job is going to be gone when all this is over yeah. with. i think it's going to bounce back whenever it's safe for people to go to like sporting events or any of it whenever people can do stuff i think comedy is going to be there and the thing that might hurt is like there might be comedy clubs 
that it's might not be open anymore but i mean when it all started it was just in bars and theaters and like right. small venues so it's like i think we'll be okay i think it's a shame that that like business some of them might not make it um and comedians i don't know like you you can get like unemployment and loans from the government now contractor mm. And there are like I did a corporate Zoom show, and people are doing Zoom shows that pay a little bit. And like, I think there will there will be ways. Um, but right now, no, like a lot of people aren't making money. It's just not our business, so mm. I don't know. I think it's hard because like, as a comic, I know for me personally, sometimes you like work, 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 and then you make a little bit of money that sort of gets you through for a couple months. Yeah. And so like, yeah. if you're at a place where you were waiting to make a lot of money. It, like with a TV thing or something that might not happen for a little bit. So it might be hard. Mm. And that's, um, so I don't know. I, I, I can't predict the future when it's all going to end, but I think when it does, people will still want to come to shows. Right. I feel yeah. like, um, and I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I feel like that, uh, where this is going to hit the hardest is those people, uh, those comics that were just ready to start going full time. Uh, you yeah. know, they, they still, they still had the day job, but they were just getting ready to go. And I feel like there's going to be a, uh, number of them that just say, screw it. I, 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 I can't even do this anymore. Yeah. The positive though, is that if they still have the day job. They might be able to still make money during all this. Yeah. Whereas like, if there's a guy who's like maybe featuring on the road, and like just making money off of merch, that could be really hard because then you're like, how do you make money at all? And then where do you, where do you even go? And it's right. It's tough. I think like right when it hit, you see a lot of people posting and, and it is hard, but, uh, and I, I feel lucky to be in a situation where I'm okay, you know, mm. so far. And like, I've had work still, um, but I think it either is going to get worse or better and who knows, you know, but I don't think it's a, whether you panic about it or are proactive about it, it's not going to change the way the economy is like, we're, it's just still going to hit you. However it hits you. Mm. It's like bad weather. Yeah. <laughs> a <laughs> yeah. Uh, re really big storm. Or you can complain about it and say it's all over, or you can be like, maybe it's not all over and it's still going to happen. Yeah. The, way it happens. the yeah. neat thing is I'm seeing some, I'm seeing some people that are, um, that, that are full time. They're just hustling like crazy right now that are, yeah. um, they're writing. I, I, a lot of them are podcasting and stuff like that and just really yeah. go, going at it. And, um, it's, it's really nice to see the, the creatives are still creating, uh, even though they're doing it in the same spot all the time. Yeah. I never, uh, I, when I started doing stand up, it was like in the early two thousands. So like YouTube, I think was probably around, but it wasn't like a way that people did comedy mm. and, uh, and social media and all that stuff. And I always participated in, in that like social media a little bit, but now like I'm trying to like, I'm doing like YouTube videos three times a week, which I never did. And mm. I think that's all stuff that as a comic can help you get a following that now we have time for because there's no, Right. Travel. And people are definitely yeah. looking for it. I, I know I am. I, yeah. I, I work, I'm working from home now and, and, uh, my breaks <laughs> are all, uh, looking for new comics to get on the show and, and yeah. watching their <laughs> videos and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, getting away from the quarantine, uh, what, what came about, what events came about the, you got the comedy central show? The half hour. Yeah. Special. So um, I had done a festival in Las Vegas in 2007, which was like my first festival in front of the industry, really. It was uh -huh. like Zanies, Zanies had a, their own little contest or something separate. And I, I moved through that. And then uh, they just picked me to be on the showcase for this Vegas thing. And that went well. And then it was all online voting and I got to go to Vegas and that's where I met the guy that booked me for live at Gotham. Okay. Which was like the, the used to be premium blend. Yeah. But it was like, everyone does five or seven minutes. Mm. And do your set. So that happened in like 2008. And then uh, between 2008 and 2000, I think 12 or 13, I kind of, I might've submitted maybe like three or four times and just didn't, I think submit, I think I got it on my third time. And so every year they'd ask for a half hour tape. And through that festival in Las Vegas, I had a manager and I knew the ladies that booked it because they booked me for Live at Gotham. Mm -hmm. um, so like three years in a row, I submitted a tape and the first two years um, I didn't get it. And uh, 
the third year, I remember I started doing, it might've been another advice thing that my friend, that Jonathan said about how doing new stuff at the beginning of a set seems to make, you make yourself do a new joke. And then also if it doesn't go well, you can just go into the rest of your set. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was was doing a weekend in, um, I was featuring in like uh, somewhere in Virginia beach, Virginia at a funny bone. And like, that's not necessarily my audience, like the Mm -hmm. South and the club or whatever, but people still like it went well, it went okay. And I remember every show I was working on new jokes. Um, and then when it came around to do my tape the next time, I had like five or six new minutes that they had never seen before to do, to put on it. And I think that helped or at least it just the tape was a lot better. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. It was just the tape that I sent in. Yeah. <laughs> it went that, that's, that's great. So do you yeah. still, um, do you still do open mics or do you uh, work out all your new stuff on the stage now? So when I'm on, on headlining and I, I playing at a club, I'll definitely try either to work out parts of a joke that already exists or a new joke. Mm. But if I'm in LA for like more than a few days and I don't have shows, like there's open mics, I can drop, stop it and try yeah. to reset. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, it seems to be a split with the people I talk to. Some people say yeah. that they just don't ever want to go to another open mic again. And some <laughs> people still like to drop in. <laughs> I kind of like slowed it down a little bit, but whenever I would have a set that I really wanted to work out, I started doing them more and then I found out about them and then I was like, Oh, I can come back here and it'll be fun. Right. Um, you, you talked about, uh, who your audience is in different parts of the country. Who, what's your favorite part of the country to perform in and what's your least favorite? Yeah, I should, I, I'd be, my shows in Virginia have been fun. The headliner was just like much different than me. So I think that's why, Yeah. um, I don't know. I feel like there's a run where the cities that cl- have comedy clubs that are also capitals of that state seem to be really good. Like Des Moines is really good. Mm. Madison's pretty good. Um, uh, Indianapolis, like medium sized cities, like I love Cincinnati, you know, like I grew up in the Midwest. So I think yeah. that helps a little bit. Um, but I did a show one time in Perrysburg, Ohio, which is near Toledo, which is the worst experience I've ever had. And I uh. think that was just a bad situation. Um, my w- my wife and I stayed the night there one night. It was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it wasn't just my experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was really bad. <laughs> but, but I think like, Whenever, uh, like Grand Rapids is really fun. Like those, a lot of Midwestern yeah. cities are really comfortable in. Yeah. 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 It's, it, I mean, you, you, you're a polite guy and, uh, <laughs> got that Midwestern charm and stuff like that. So I, I can see where you'd hit really, hit really well there. Um, think, thinking about the, um, where you are now and when you first started, I asked this of everybody, what three things do you wish you would have known when you started that, you know, now? Um, I think one thing I like, maybe it was a, a thought or like just a feeling that it was all going to be okay. Cause I feel like when I started out of college, I didn't have a, I was living with my parents and they were nice and supportive, but I still feel like when you're living off of people, you feel this, I felt this like guilt. Mm. And I think I, I would have told myself that like I was doing something valuable and it was going to work out in some sense or the other. Mm. And to believe in your, I think the second thing I would tell myself is to really whatever you want in this business or in life, just sort of believe that it can happen and practice that positive thinking and uh, imagine it happening. Cause I think that goes a long way, whether it actually causes that thing to happen or just puts you in a mental attitude to make it happen i think it helps i think my first spot on the tonight show like i've literally visualized stuff like that happening uh-huh. uh, and then the third thing i think would be just overall um to go like how how long of a journey it is and how you can uh get really good at one thing and that's, that's all also good. I feel like when I started, I was like, I'm going to do stand up to do TV and movies. Cause I always wanted to be an actor. And then as I got farther along and that didn't happen, um, I realized that I like stand up a lot too. And I think I would have told myself to enjoy this part of it, whether mm. it is the thing that you do forever or it's a thing that leads something else. You don't have to look down on it or not that I ever look down on it, but like not appreciate it. Just, just because you're doing something doesn't mean it's not as good as the thing everyone else is doing. I think sometimes there's that sense of like, Oh, they got hired for this show. So that might be the best job. When, whereas like, if you talk to standups who love standup, like that's their best job. And I think there's right. a reason for that because yeah. it is. 
I really like that you men mentioned visualization because that's something yeah. I, I'm not a sports guy, but I heard one guy, he, he was a basketball coach. Maybe it was, um, that bulls coach. Uh, he was talking about, v yeah, v visualizing the ball going through the hoop and that, that always stuck with me. So I always, and, and it's not just comedy, everything I do, I visualize myself succeeding at it. And, and, yes. and, uh, it's, seems to it seems to help in a lot of ways because yeah. you you come up there feeling like oh I've already done this and it's been great so let's let's just do it for real now yeah I feel like I I get away from it like I'll be really good at it and then I'll stop because it's just like there's little mental choices I heard Kevin Hart say that one time because he was doing so much stuff and doing so well and he was just like well I'm just more efficient now and I think there are little mental choices of like okay, I'm going to imagine myself doing well before I do go on stage or I'm going to, when I go to bed at night, I'm going to imagine how tomorrow's going to go. And like, oh, I'm, I'm going to think about my jokes while I'm doing this thing rather than just like watching TV or whatever. Right. And I think those little things can build up to something bigger. Like everyone's going to have their own path and wherever you end up is where you end up. But I think like if you put yourself in a position to, comp to keep getting better, it's going to feel better because you're going to be like, oh, I'm doing this now and I'm building right. on this. Yeah. 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 The, the power of positive thinking. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned at the uh, start of this that you've got uh, another album coming out. Do you, do you have that like in the can ready to go or are you still uh, putting that together? No. Yeah. We recorded it the last week, the first like weekend of February in at Acme in Minneapolis. And, uh, it's pretty much all edited. We have the artwork and I'm just waiting to find out when we're going to release it. And then I did a dry bar back in October. They're supposed to release at some point this month too. Mm -hmm. A couple yeah. of people I've talked to have got dry bars ready to go. So that's yeah. pretty cool. I, I look, I watch their site and man, they are just going nuts right now. They're, yeah. they're, they're doing really well. What does a comedy album, what, what does that mean to a comic these days because it's obviously yeah. different than when you sold vinyl because you actually made money from it uh, yeah. so, so what, what what does that mean for a comic right now yeah i think every level like my first one i think um i just made money after shows uh -huh. I just CDs, they were five or ten dollars and that's the only way i really made money and then and like when i did last comic we went on the tour and i was able to like i still have some left but i sold them that way mm. um my second one is when, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was the quality of this, the actual recording or just my jokes, but that's when I started, they started playing it on Sirius. So it was like, I really made my money, the majority of it on Sirius radio. Cool. And then when it was on the road, it would cover some travel to sell them after the show. Mm. Um, so I think that's the way I started looking at it. When people, like, especially in LA, comics would be like, oh, it's not worth it for me to go to this club. And I was like, well, they are paying you more than it costs to get there. And these jokes are going to get so much better. And you're going to make these jokes so much money off these jokes, just playing it on serious. So it's kind of like, it kind of changed the game from like, Oh, this is what I'm getting paid for this moment to like, sort of like getting paid to write a piece of or like novel, like a novel or like that, that you're going to make a lot of money for later. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the way the second one was. And then this one, I don't know. We'll find out uh, 800 pound gorilla is the one that are doing it. And I heard they're very good at like marketing it. Uh -huh. And so I think they get played on serious. And that's probably why, where the majority of it will come from. But hopefully, uh, I think there'll be download cards now rather than like there'll be some CDs, but I think right. people will buy download cards. Yeah. So that'll be interesting. Cause I, I looked at prices, they cost the same amount as producing a CD did for my old one. It's yeah. Like, but it's just, <laughs> so it's interesting. Um, but maybe you'll sell more because of that or maybe you'll sell less. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I know that like some guys, when they release an album, they're like, I'm done with that material. When they do something on TV, they're done with it. I've had a lot of, good experiences uh never being done with anything forever just knowing that you could use it if you want to and pushing uh -huh. as long as you're pushing yourself to move on and write new stuff i think it's fine to do jokes from whenever you did them yeah and yeah. it's funny um it, it makes a good like um like a, a a personal diary and a personal growth uh chart for a comic because it's uh 
you talked about Dan Cummins. When I discovered him, I started listening to his albums from the first to the last. And it's Mm -hmm. amazing. The first album's good, um, but every one got better. And and he became more confident. His material was better and all that. So it's really neat to watch the growth. um, And it's it's archived forever like that. So uh, you can always go back and say, you know, this is where I was then. Yeah. And I remember like there were a couple like I think like Leno and like Seinfeld were like, don't ever record your stuff because then you can't do it anymore. And I feel like it's been the opposite. Like I remember the jokes because they're on an album. If I ever need to go do something like a corporate or like if I go to a new town, like there's I can go back and be like, oh, this is stuff that I can do. And like, right. there's some really bad shows where you need all three hours to get through the hour. Yeah. Or whatever. <laughs> no doubt. Um uh, finally, I, I've had you on for a while. Finally, uh, can you talk a little bit about the last comic standing experience? I mean, that's yeah. been a while, but uh, what, what was that like for you? Yeah. So do you want like, so from the beginning, uh, I, and I think like 2005, I think I did one of those things where you wait outside yeah. and like overnight. And I remember at Chicago at Zany's, uh, they were having problems in other cities or the year before with people like staying out all night. So they made a rule that you can only get there at like 4 a.m. or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then what people did was you couldn't get in line to them. People just lined up separately from the line. And then like <laughs> there was a line already. So I remember getting in there at like 4 and there were people there. And all of a sudden someone showed up at like 6 with these forms to fill out. And people just like rushed the guy. Oh. <laughs> so that didn't help. And I got a form. I did get to audition. But it was like right before I went on, like I could, I was waiting for the other people to finish. And the judges who I met later and they booked me for stuff, uh, I think for the tonight show where they were the judges back then, uh-huh. um, they were like, all right, that was the last guy, two people in front of me. There's like, and they're like, no, we got these people in here. Cause the club had put people in front of us that yeah. weren't uh, like got forms or whatever. And they were just like so upset. They started like swearing. And then it was like, then I had to be like, okay, I'm hi. I don't like, that was like my turn to go up right after they're so upset. Oh, man. And so like, I didn't get it then. And, uh, I don't know what it would have been like to get it then. Like I, I've hung out with people that got it then and their lives are much different than mine. But I feel like anytime I haven't gotten something, it's made me get better at it rather yeah. than like now I'm touring as the last comic standing person. So I don't know what I need to grow at because I'm just already working a lot. Right. So then like six years ago, or maybe more than six years, uh, nine years go by to 2014 and I auditioned again. And that's when they invite you out. Um, and I was already in LA, but it was just in front of like a Wanda who's producing it and some other people. Mm. And it was one of those sets where I was like, Oh, I know these jokes are great, but it didn't seem like they were going to do it. Mm. And they, they put me on as an alternate and they ended up getting to do it. And I thought my set went well in the theater, but um, they didn't move me on. It was like the year Rodman won. And, mm. uh, and I was like kind of bummed because I felt like I already felt like I was there. I was like, with anything else, I was like, Oh, I could have done this 10 years ago. Like, Right. I would feel like comedy, like, oh, I could have done this then. But then the next year, um, I went to the rap party the year before, and uh, Paige, the executive producer, was there. And I think she felt bad because they didn't even use my set on TV at all, which I was like, I don't care. That's fine. You yeah. Know? I've been, luckily, I'd been on TV at that point. So it wasn't like this is my big break. But she's like, don't worry. We didn't use you because we wanted to use you the next year. You'll do it next year. And I was like, uh-huh. oh, that's great. So. I go to the audition for the next year and it's like a Thursday at 10 30 PM at the improv. And it's like, I tried to do some new stuff and I was like, it was one of those things where looking back, it's like, Oh, they're not going to pick me from that. There's no way. Uh-huh. And I didn't hear anything, but I, I was so, it was one of those positive things by accident where like Paige told me I was doing it. So I was like, well, I'm probably doing it. So I went through the whole like months waiting where people were getting callbacks and I was like, I'm probably doing it. You know, I haven't heard anything. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody, but I was just like, I'm probably going to get to do it. And then uh, I was working in Cleveland at Hilarities, headlining an off night. And Dave Landau, who's very funny, oh yeah, uh, was he had never worked at that club, so he was featuring just to get in. And he destroyed. Like I couldn't follow him. He, he's uh. dirty, too, but he's still very funny, um, even if he wasn't dirty. And uh, so I, like I got like I couldn't follow him. My, I had family in the crowd; they were very nice. But <laughs> one thing I got out of that before the show, I was asking him about Last Comic Standing because he did it the year before. Mm. And, he didn't like if you're in the top 10 you can't do it the next year but he so he got pretty far but not that far and i was like oh are you doing it again do you know if they're doing it again he's like i don't know if i'm gonna do it but they're they're i think they're doing it soon and i hadn't heard anything from the show at all at that point Uh so like i uh, i went back to the hotel or whatever and uh i just emailed 
the assistant I knew and was like, Hey, uh, Paige said I was doing it. I haven't heard anything from you guys. And I put a link on to, I luckily got to do Conan that year. And I was like, here's something I did recently. And they were like, Oh yeah, we had someone drop out. I don't know if it was Dave or somebody, but someone wasn't going to do it. Oh. And then I keep you Friday. And, uh, I remember I just got done talking with my dad because it was spring. He had just done my taxes and he was like, I don't know if you're going to be able to make it. You need to find, you need to find something else. And he's always been supportive, uh-huh. but he was like, I don't know if this is your thing. And I was like, okay, yeah. And uh, I was going to Atlantic City uh, for that week. And so it was the next Friday. So I was in Atlantic City working at the club there and uh, they offered me to do it. And my dad was like, the week before he was like, you need to figure something out. And then uh, when I told him I could do last comic standing, uh, it was when I was going to tape was going to be the week when I was in Chicago and him, I found out later, like the what people he worked with were going to come to that show that I wouldn't be able to do. And he was like, I don't know if you should do it. They don't really put comics in a good light on that show. And he's basically talking me into not doing it. Yeah. And then, uh, my manager wasn't really super on board. He was like, this might be a good year for you. It might not be a good year. But then I talked to my friend, Tommy again, John again, and he was like, Oh, it's great. You should definitely do the show. So I, I just, I did it. And it was one of those things where I worked the week at Zane's, which was a Tuesday through Sunday. So I did Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then I was taping on a Friday and Bert at Zane's is great. Like mm. whenever something comes up, he's always like, yeah, you should definitely go do that. Um, so he left me off for Friday and uh, I was in my parents' house uh, texting the producer. Cause there was a, there's a rule. This might be too long of a version for you. Yes. But there's a rules, a rules meeting before the contest starts that everybody has to be at legally. Mm. And it's at 10 a.m. before my taping. And I'd gone the year before, so I was texting the producer. I was like, I, I think I landed at LAX at like 9. I don't know if I'm going to make it by 10, but I went last year. And like, well, if you don't make it to that, you just can't do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I was at my parents' house at 2 a.m., and I see there's a flight that leaves at 5.30 a.m. out of O'Hare to Burbank, which is much closer to like the meetings in Burbank. Uh. I was like, well played in Burbank at like 9.30 or whatever, 9.15. Like I should make the 10 a.m. meeting. So I just booked that flight then. I just go to the airport then. And uh, I had an apartment in L.A., so I was just in Chicago working. So I flew to Burbank, did the meeting, and then the taping was that night. So I was just basically, well, all day basically. It was like an eight-hour shoot. I was just hanging out in this green room, which wasn't a green room. It's just a set that's really brightly lit. Uh It's like 40 other comics. They're taping it all. And if you watch the show, they use probably like, maybe 30 seconds of right. that footage yeah so but everyone's like i don't know a good like five or six comics are like on the whole time because they yeah. are trying to prove the producers that they need to be well if you ever do last comic standing if it ever comes back i just tried to sleep the whole time like i talked uh, a little bit to people but i did very i did nothing to get anybody's attention in that yeah. at all <laughs> and i was i was uh i think i was also lucky that season the season I did it before, I was near the end of the taping or whatever. Mm. And I think when you go near the end, it might be more difficult. Whereas, like, I'd done it the year before, and I think Paige put me up front. I was, like, number four. So I went up fourth, and it went well. Like, I worked on my set at the clubs all week, and all week I worked on that set. And uh, and at the end of the show, at the end of the, they announced I was moving on. So I flew back to Chicago to do the Saturday shows. I got out of the Sunday shows because we had to be back to tape last comic standing again. I think my tape, my next round was on Tuesday. The next rounds were Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And uh, the Tuesday round was like a little longer. It was like four minutes you got to do. Mm. So I worked on that set at my Zany shows. And um, and I think that one was the one that uh, I did like older stuff. Like my the first season I did last comic standing, one of the notes I got was like, I didn't sound like myself. I sounded like a character or whatever. And I think it was because I was doing really old jokes that were still funny, but it was like kind of hard to go back in time mm. just from the beginning. So for last comic, I tried to do like a newer joke that worked really well and then just do whatever I thought would work really well. Um, so like for that Tuesday show though, I think I did like a newer joke, but then like my jokes in between were kind of about like college and living at home. And I felt like the judges weren't as much on board. But my last joke, uh, Keenan really liked, and it was a joke I did on Letterman. And uh, and that, like, moved me on. Like, I think, like, Keenan even said that. He's like, I, I was kind of whatever, but then the last joke, that, whatever. Uh-huh. So uh, that was a, like, I, you don't find out till the end, but it felt really good. And then you go to, like, a head head one. But we got to go back home. This was Easter week. So, like, I got to go home for four days. Or not four days, maybe, like, three or four days. And I remember the Saturday before Easter, just going around Chicago, and I did like six sets. 
because we were going to have two shows if you moved on back to back in days. So there wouldn't be a lot of time to work on your second set. Mm. I just worked on both sets throughout those six shows. And it was really nice. Like Zanies let me do sets and like got to drop in and do a set at Second City during their improv show. And uh, it was so much fun because I had this thing to work on. I was also very tired and getting sick because yeah. I was traveling so much. And uh, I got to Monday and my matchup person was Taylor Tomlinson, who uh, was like, nobody knew who she was at the time. She was just like the youngest person that I don't, maybe had ever been that far on the show. Like she was so young. Mm. And uh, they matched me up with her because they thought I was also young, which I'm not anywhere near her. Yeah. <laughs> I did my set. And I felt really good about it. Like I went first and I felt like it went better than the one before and it went really well. And then um, I could hear hers. Like when you do last comic standing, they never let you watch or hear anybody unless yeah. it's the person that's before you. Um, just so we don't, you never know how anybody does, but when you, when the head to head, like I went first, so I got to hear her from off stage and uh, she did great. Um, and it went down to the judges, like the judges pick who moves on that one. And like Norm, picked me but he didn't really pick me he was just like well uh michael's been doing it 11 years and uh taylor's been doing it four <laughs> not to say what taylor's done in 11 years she might be better than michael but there's no way doing know. that so <laughs> we have to go down now so she he picked me and then roseanne picked taylor and then keenan was very nice roseanne was like uh i think taylor had more more laughs or whatever and keenan was like i don't i don't think so and he picked me and in that moment it was really special because uh, I just felt like I was going to have a job. Because if you get to the final five, you get to go on tour. Mm-hmm. And it was 78 shows. I think at that point we knew that. Wow. So it was like, you're going to work for four months. And uh, at the time, like I said, I didn't, my, my accountant, my dad was like, you can't do this anymore, probably. <laughs> and, and looking back, I think everybody that was in the top 10 has done either better or just as good as everybody that's on top five. Like Taylor has Netflix special. Yeah. She's she's already huge. And um, like one of my friends, Ryan Connor, got an agent. And uh, Joe List had a half hour on Netflix. So I think everybody that was in the top 10 that didn't move on to the, the tour had all that heat from being on the show, even right. though it wasn't necessarily like the show anymore, where they got to monopolize on it or capitalize on it. Well, it was like we were going on the road. So I think it worked out for everybody. But then the top five set was the next day. And I went to the club flappers down the street and I talked my way to get on stage to work on five minutes. Cause you we weren't allowed to tell anybody you were in last comic standing, but I just kind of like, I need to do this. Yeah. I feel like that's at, um, I felt like for the whole taping, the audience is a lot of paid audience members. So mm-hmm. they're like, they're listening for jokes. And I felt like my set is very, can be very like set up punchline, but also, um, isn't as much as like some people's. So I feel like, when I worked on that last set, I put a joke first that I felt like, oh, if they like this joke, then I could win because I think it's a that means they're they're gonna like my set, they're gonna like me. It's a different joke than a lot of the stuff I do, and uh, it'll go really well. And it turns out I got to go first on that taping, which I had never gone first the whole time. Like I'd always gone early, so it was good, but never first. And so I went first, and I found out later. Uh, Rodman came back to do a set. We knew that. Mm-hmm. And um, he said hi to us. It was filmed and it was like this thing. And then he went out and did this. And I, and I found out, I didn't know, but I found out like, not Rodman's hilarious, but the audience was not just laughing at that point. They just didn't, it just didn't go well. Yeah. And I didn't know that. So I go out with this first joke that I think it's on my album. Like it's, it's more hit or miss than looking back. I would have liked and it went okay, but uh, not as well as I liked. And then the rest of the set was good. But, uh, I didn't win, obviously. And I feel like if I would have moved like my last joke to my first joke, it could have made a difference, but I can't change it. So, yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like all the sets up to that set, I had done, I picked the jokes really well. Whereas like that set, I feel like if I could have gone back, I would have just tried to set it up so it had a good set mm-hmm. and then maybe a great set rather than like I could have a great set or it could be like maybe okay. Yeah. So that's my only advice if you're ever doing one of those shows always make sure that you can do well. And then if it goes great, that's great. But always try to open that strong and just keep it strong rather than being like, oh, if this joke works, because sometimes it works great, but sometimes it doesn't. I would mm-hmm. play the averages and just play the joke that usually does great and then maybe have some more average jokes in the middle or something. Right, right. But then like, I mean, they didn't announce it, but it was like Clayton won and then I think I was fourth, but it was just like, they didn't even show that. It was just Clayton won and then we did the tour. 
and I was on a bus for four months and it was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's a neat story. And Norm McDonald, <laughs> he, he's somebody I really want. I really want to interview right now. I'm, yeah. um, uh, working with gatekeepers, uh, with, with Norm, yeah. but, uh, uh, I'd really, really like to get him on the shows because, uh, he's just, he's just the most unique guy. And <laughs> yeah. he, uh, he was really nice. He said nice things about me on Twitter and you're right. He's very unique. And I think that's like you were saying earlier, like him and like David Letterman, you hear about like, they're both very successful. And I think if you saw them before they were successful, you would remember them yeah. versus like someone who was like uh, maybe just doing as getting as good of laughs, but maybe not as memorable, right. whatever that thing is. And that's not to say that person is getting laughs isn't good. That's just like, for some reason they remember it. Yeah. 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 yeah that's a great story. It, it <laughs> sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it, it's funny. Like uh, it was, and I think like before when I had to do sets like that, I didn't put in as much because I wanted it to be fresh. And then I realized, oh, the more I work it, the better I'm going to be. And mm. yeah. Yeah. Cool. And it's very fun because it's like I did. It's not very often in comedy where it's like, this is the person I want. And this person didn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, yeah. It's a good, but yeah. And Rodman was just a huge personality. That, oh, yeah. that I mean, he, I remember that year and he was just uh, everybody loved him. And th- I that's... remember going up. Uh, last co- our, uh, the county magic club and seeing him there and he would just always every word would just people would just destroy yeah and that season too was like there had a lot of challenges whereas ours which i feel lucky about it was just stand-up so you didn't have to be good at anything else other yeah. than stand-up I feel like i feel like they made it fun in that sense yeah yeah that's cool um so where can people find you and uh see your stuff you talked about youtube so um yeah wh- wh- where can people find you right now so my name is everything. It's Michael Palasak, P-A-L-A-S-C-A-K. Um, that's my YouTube channel, my Facebook, my website, my Twitter, and my Instagram. On YouTube, I started doing a series called The Bright Side, where I do a minute video on the positives of things usually people complain about. Uh-huh. And I do a couple of those a week. And so people could watch and subscribe. And then like uh, my album will come out, and that'll be on my website and all those places. And then my dry bar, will look if you, if you hear something that goes to dry bar, it's called 1984, and so it'll be on dry bar at the end of the month. Okay, great. Is yeah. that the year you yeah. were born, 84? No, I just have a joke about 1984. I'm I'm trying to get an idea of ages here, but uh... <laughs> yeah, I pull a Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I really appreciate you being on the show, Michael. I, yeah, no, I think I learned a lot, and I think everybody that listens uh, is going to learn a lot, too. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, you have a great show. Welcome to Breeze Line, where you'll say, ta-ta, T-Mobile, because we have 99.9% network reliability, and they don't. That's right. Time, weather, or even streaming in a basement won't affect our superior service. That's because we have real internet, backed by our fiber-powered network. And T-Mobile? Well, they just have a 5G cellular network. So for a limited time, find your perfect speed with prices starting at $19.99 a month for 24 months. Terms and conditions apply. Go to BreezeLine.com to learn more. The Venture X card from Capital One gives you premium travel benefits. Perfect for seeing Taylor Swift The Eras Tour. Presented by Capital One. Ooh, I do love her. Earn five times miles on flights and ten times miles on hotels through Capital One Travel. Enjoy your stay in Suite 13. Whoa, 13? That's Taylor's lucky number. The Venture X card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details.